Iraq, dozens of officials, including former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, are referred to court over the fall of Mosul to the Islamic State, while military commanders face a court-martial over the fall of Ramadi. An Indonesian passenger plane with 54 people on board disappears off the grid, now believed to have crashed in the mountain area eastern Papua region. The Israeli government approves a highly controversial deal to develop offshore gas fields that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says will deliver a massive windfall of cash into the country. The News Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening and welcome to the news today. Two major military losses for the Iraqi government, Mosul and Ramadi, are now become, becoming the focus of Prime Minister Khaidr al-Abadi's campaign to root out corruption. He's paved the way for military commanders to face justice over the withdrawal from Ramadi, while no less than former Premier Nouri al-Maliki is being implicated over the fall of Mosul. Elie Ochenberg has the story. Mosul. June 2014, Ramadi, May 2015. Two major military failures of the Iraqi government are now back in the spotlight due to go under thorough investigation, and no one seems to be immune. On Sunday, Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al abadi approved an investigative council's decision to refer military commanders to a court-martial for abandoning their positions in the battle against IS militants in Ramadi. Only a few hours after the announcement, an Iraqi parliamentary panel called for at least 30 security and political officials, including former Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki, to be referred to court in connection with the fall of the northern city of Mosul to the Islamic State about a year prior to the fall of Ramadi. On June 9, 2014, IS militants overran the city of Mosul and took control of a population then believed to be 2 million people. The city remains the extremist biggest stronghold in Iraq. The fall of Mosul was a huge achievement for the terror group and a highly traumatic event for the Iraqi government, which decided in response to arm its civilians, reorganize the military and involve a collaboration between Sunni tribal fighters and the U.S. military. Yet less than a year later, the Iraqi government and military's embarrassment was even bigger when the capital of the western Anbar province, Ramadi, fell to the Islamic State as well. The decision to investigate comes as part of Abadi's extensive reform campaign to reshuffle the government and combat corruption and mismanagement in the country. The prime minister, whose plan was unanimously approved by the Iraqi parliament last Tuesday, further vowed to hold a referendum to amend the constitution and receiving broad public support. There is no more time to waste. We have to start reforming. No more time for patient and inaction. We have reached a point of no return. We authorized the prime minister, El Abadi, to start all the suitable reforms in order to raise the level of life for citizens in the same level in the country is close in the region. Meanwhile, a series of bombings across Baghdad killed at least 24 people on Saturday, only two days after the deadliest attack in the Iraqi capital since Abadi took office one year ago. On Thursday, over 70 people were killed in a massive truck bomb blast claimed by the Islamic State. And with me right now is Tom Harb, chairman of American Middle East Coalition for Democracy. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining me, Tom. Good evening. You know, Tom, I'm trying to understand what would it help to fight corruption, to do investigation about Ramadi, about Mosul, when the country is still facing all these bombings and all these terror attacks? I think there are three things that have to be done. The influence of Iran inside Iraq should stop, should cease. Otherwise, Iran is going to play the guys on the ground to use them as they wish. Number two, it should be a correction system for the corruption, because the corruption towards certain sectarian groups, mainly the Shia, and the Shiites who are loyal to the Iranian, those are the corrupt group. And you cannot take the Mosul back, and you cannot take Al-Anbar region or any of Salah al-Din region back 
unless you find a political solution for the, the disoriented people on the ground. The Sunnis, what kind of they think... What kind of political solution we are talking about when Iran is so involved in this fighting? Exactly. And now Iran is going to get another $150 billion from the Obama administration and from Western nations who signed on the nuclear deal. So they are going to be more empowered to give to the guys who are loyal more to them and they will fulfill their agenda inside Iraq and in the region. We don't think at this time there is a solution for Iraq except go into federation system and build from the federation system onward to find a permanent solution in the long run against the sectarian regimes. Or You cannot fight ISIS while the people of Al-Anbar region and Salah al-Din region gave the opportunity to ISIS to take over because when they were given the choices between the Iranian influence inside Iraq or ISIS, obviously they preferred ISIS because they believed from the same sect, from the same religion, from the same belief. But Tom, let's try to look at the positive uh, thing in this specific situation. Maybe uh, Iran is the only one right now that can fight ISIS. Maybe no one else can fight it. So maybe this is the only way to try and get back these regions that uh, were falling into the hands of ISIS. The only people to fight ISIS are the indigenous people of the region. And the indigenous people of the region is the people of Ambar, of the people of uh, Salah al-Din, the, the cities of Fallujah and Ramadi area. Those are the only people. But when they believe that the political system is with them, they are given the opportunity, if they need any outside force, it should not come from the Shiite region. It should be an Arab force coming from Egypt, coming from Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, where they believe yes. they, are, they are coming to help out and drive ISIS out. They are not coming to, to, take, them, uh, to take certain sects out and take advantage of the situation. Yes, uh, Tom Harb, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for this talk with us. And right now with me here in the studio, Senior Middle East Analyst Ali Wakid, good evening. Good evening, Lucy. So uh, we're looking currently at the specific situation that in Iraq and the entire Middle East. And we just uh, heard Tom Harb connecting the Iran nuclear deal and Iran to what is happening. You know, at the end of the day, it comes out that Iran is the new savior of the Middle East, maybe the only savior that can try and maybe replace other powers that are not Doing savior, it's not the world. I think that Iran uh, uh, domains uh, many of the keys of the uh, of the region in many uh, countries, in many uh, uh, conflicts, and I think that uh, uh, distancing uh, Iran from the uh, Iranian, uh, from the Iraqi uh, uh, issue, is not uh, is not realistic. Uh, is not realistic. On the contrary, any uh, solution that we want to be uh, uh, lasting uh, should take into consideration Iran and should take into consideration Iran uh, uh, interests in the uh, in the region. The Al-Dawa party, the leading ruling uh, Shia uh, party, uh, has its uh, headquarters also in, in Tehran. Not only it, it is an Iraqi party, but it has uh, important uh, headquarters in uh, in Iran, which shows the uh, uh, relations between the Shia majority in Iraq and between uh, Iran. And we cannot uh, separate Iran from Iraq, Iran from the Shia majority in Iraq, in a uh, in a hocus focus, in a in a. Um, from a day to tomorrow, we need to have many measures. And I think that the uh, wave of anti-corruption uh, demonstrations and uh, uh, the fact that Prime Minister uh, Abadi is uh, uh, collaborating with the uh, with the masses can be a good platform in order to send a message to the uh, Sunni minority that, yes, we are sanctioning uh, Shiite uh, corrupted uh, responsibles and leaders. Even al-Maliki uh, would be uh, uh, will be accused for this corruption and for the uh, fall of, of Mosul. And we should show the uh, Sunni majority that, yes, we, you would be part of any political arrangement in the future. I want to understand something. When Khaydar al-Abadi is coming and trying to fight corruption, putting some, you know, investigations about the fall of Mosul and Ramadi, he doesn't have any, f like, like, we cannot blame him on what happened. Can you blame these people that uh, Mosul and Ramadi fell in their time? Time with the specific situation that Iraq was in? Hyderabadi was a leading actor. Investigating what? 
what exactly? Hader al Abad is a leading actor in Al Dawa uh, uh, ruling party. Nouri al Maliki is the general secretary and the leader of Al Dawa ruling uh, party. Uh, uh, the change was not uh, a dramatic. The change was personal. They replaced a leader from the Al Dawa party by another leader from the Al Dawa party that had uh, less sectarian uh, motivations in his uh, in his policy. That is more Iraqi than only loyal to Iran, as was uh, uh, Nouri uh, al Maliki. But and it, at the end of the day, you were right, Lucy, because you cannot touch. It is a cosmetic, only a cosmetic operation if we want to deal with uh, some responsibilities and not to touch the real and profound problem, which is the sectarian tension that, as Tom Harp said, made the Sunni minority prefer ISIS on, on Iran. So let's uh, move from Iraq to Syria. In Syria, a government airstrike northeast of Damascus killed at least 80 people in a marketplace in the rebel hell town of Douma. At least 200 more people were wounded in the attack, with a death toll likely to rise. The British-based NGO, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, said at least 10 rockets were fired during the attack and accused the warplanes of bombing again after rescue work has arrived at the scene. The head of the NGO called it a documented massacre. And uh, just uh, from you, Ali, you know, each and every day we're seeing documented massacres happening in Syria. No one actually is doing anything. The fight in Syria continues to be between the rebels and uh, Syrian forces. And it seems that it's, again, the same tango dance that we're talking all the time. Sometimes Bashar al-Assad is on the top, sometimes he's just falling behind. Lucy, I'm afraid that these uh, these atrocities will be uh, repeated because we entered in a, in, an, in a moment where there are uh, some uh, diplomatic initiatives on the table uh, from the uh, Saudis, from the Russians, from the uh, Americans, and it is obvious that there is a unanimity among the international community that only a political uh, solution, solution is relevant for the Syrian crisis, which means that any solution should be dealt on the table. And in order to come to the table in a strong position, the parties are committed these atrocities and the civilians are paying the, uh, the price of these uh, atrocities. And until the moment that the international community calls for everybody to come around a table in Geneva or, or, or elsewhere, there will be a more of uh, bloodshed and more of uh, these kind of massacres. But we should pay attention that people, uh, the, the parties are understanding that we are getting close for the moment of coming to the table. This is why Damascus is more than ever targeted. And this is why in Zabadani and elsewhere, the regime is doing everything in order to start to try to cut the roads of the Islamic states and the uh, jihadists. Well, basically, in order that it will get better, it needs to get worse. Ali Wakad, thank you very much thank for this. It has been a bloody couple of days in the West Bank with a wave of stabbing attacks. So-called lone wolf attackers are extremely hard to stop, but as military correspondent Shai Ben-Ari explains, it wasn't necessarily unexpected. It was another weekend of violence in the West Bank as tensions remain high between Israelis and Palestinians. In the early evening hours of Saturday, an Israeli border policeman suffered light injuries near Hawara in the West Bank when a 21-year-old Palestinian stabbed him with a knife. The attacker, Kamil Rafiq Al-Taj, was shot and killed by other border police nearby who had been carrying out routine security checks in the area. Earlier in the day, another stabbing attack occurred near Beit Harun, also in the West Bank. A Palestinian approached a soldier at an Israeli military checkpoint in the area and asked him for water. He then stabbed the soldier in the upper part of his body before other soldiers on site shot the attacker and neutralized him. He is seen here on the ground after being shot. He was later taken for interrogation, where he said he had become agitated after arguing with his father before deciding to carry out a terror attack. I wish to commend the IDF soldiers and border police soldiers for their firm actions over the weekend, which prevented a number of terrorist attacks. Our policy is zero tolerance towards terrorism. Those who attempt to harm us will be harmed. Only last Sunday, yet another stabbing attack took place not far away on the same road known as Route 443. One man was injured and the attacker shot dead. In a vehicular attack three days before that, three soldiers were injured in the central West Bank with the assailant also shot and injured. Earlier that week, an Israeli was injured when her vehicle was hit by a Molotov cocktail in East Jerusalem. 
All of these attacks are perceived by Israeli security services as part of a wave of lone wolf terror attacks that was in fact anticipated following the murder of a Palestinian toddler and his father in an arson attack in the village of Duma at the end of July. The situation in the West Bank is one of heightened alert, exemplified Saturday night when security forces rushed to the area of Shiloh following reports of a female driver being injured by Palestinian stone throwers. This report turned out to be false, though there were numerous incidents of stone throwing throughout the day, and the area remains a veritable tinderbox. Yes, and with me right now here in the studio is military correspondent Shah Ben Ari. Good evening. Good evening. And also senior Middle East analyst Avi Sahal. Good evening. Good evening. So, let's Shah, let's start with you about. Um Yes, the Palestinian, Palestinian Authority, Authority. reacting to the incidents of yesterday, basically condemning the killing of the attacker in the incident uh, near Hawara, calling the Israeli response uh, in a statement a crime that continues a series of daily killings, which it is no longer possible to remain silent over. That is the wording of the statement. The PA basically blames Israel for what it also perceives to be an escalation, and certainly there's no argument over the very uh, fact of the escalation, but blames, uh, places the blame squarely on the so shoulders of the Israeli state. A very different approach from the Israeli side, as the the uh, the actions of the attack of the uh, border policemen there in Hawara were commended by the Israeli Prime Minister and Defense. And of course, uh, that the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu or the Israeli government is usually blaming the PA for these uh, lone wolf uh, attacks. That actually you cannot stop them. Right. Uh, it's not obviously not an organized effort by the PA to uh, put these uh, attacks into place, and there is a certain uh, debate over whether Hamas is responsible or not, but uh, certainly, a, a, um, let's say, a, a, a differing approach when it, you talk about the responsibility for this situation. I mean, we've been sitting here for a long time, and we've been saying that these kind of acts, we cannot stop them. Israel cannot stop this, let's say, somebody who's uh, just getting up in the morning and saying to himself, you know what, today I had enough, I want to go and start stabbing people. And I'm trying to understand by Israel blaming the PA, how is it helping the current situation? It doesn't. It doesn't, but this is almost the instinct that we hear from the Israeli government, that we feel from the Israeli government. They cannot say we're the blame, we're the responsible for the current situation in the West Bank, so they point the finger at the Palestinian Authority and they say this is the incitement that the Palestinian Authority is using. Uh, the bottom line, in reality, the, the reality is completely the opposite, meaning the Palestinian Authority is, is responsible for the relative quietness that we witnessed in the West Bank in the last couple of years. The Palestinian security forces dismantled and stopped many tens and tens and tens of terrorist attacks against Israeli targets. And I would say more than that. Today, we're in a kind of a dead end. I mean, there's no political process, there's no peace negotiations, and the Israeli government understands that. It, it thinks that it can manage the conflict, but it doesn't intend to solve the conflict. And this is the price that we're paying now. Then again, they cannot come to the Israeli public and say, listen, this is the price for not solving the, the, the conflict, but for managing it. So they point a the finger at the Palestinian thought and they say they are the blame. But Mahmoud Abbas uh, basically threatening to leave is what? what it will do to Israel, because Israel, and from what I read from your article, it will leave Israel with the keys to the West Bank. Of course, and this is what one of the columnists wrote yesterday, Hafez al-Baghuthi, who is uh, considered to be very close to Mahmoud Abbas, chief editor of uh, Al Hayat al-Jadida. He wrote, if Mahmoud Abbas will retire, will uh, resign for this reason or the other, the, there won't be any successor. Forget about other successor. The only successor that will be is the Israeli occupation, and he mentioned the name of Kogat Yoav Poli Mordechai as the future successor of Mahmoud Abbas. He was very cynical, of course, but he's intending to say what he meant to say is that, look, there's not going to be any Palestinian leader after Mahmoud Abbas if he will resign. You will remain with the West Bank, and you, as the Israelis, you will need to manage the issues of the West Bank. If we're talking about uh, security coordination, this still continues between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Certainly, it continues, though, of course, the Palestinians have an interest in maintaining the public or, let's say, media profile of that coordination of very low, as low as possible, and there were numerous threats over the course of the past year uh, of uh, basically uh, cutting off all coordination. There were certain uh, uh, steps made to sort of lower the level of coordination, but uh, on the ground, when you talk about uh, the situation right now, there is ongoing coordination, and, and in fact, it's an interest of the, Israel, of the Palestinian authorities themselves, because Hamas represents a very real, very vital threat to their own security.
And if we were talking about Hamas, some reports today are indicating exactly. that Hamas is actually going back to the Tony Blair, uh, let's say, some kind of agreement that was supposed to be reached with Israel. Look, this is very interesting. I would say even fascinating what is happening in the last 24, 48 hours. We see so many different reports coming from Hamas direction, coming from Turkey's direction. But the Israeli side is saying, no, we don't know anything about it. We don't know. It's, they're not saying there is no agreement coming, there is not, no negotiations. They're saying, we don't know. I mean, as if what? the negotiations are taking place between Tony Blair and the leadership of Hamas, but with no Israeli side in it. Now, what, what, what of, I yes. saw in my uh, in the, the the websites now coming from Arisala, which is uh, a Hamas affiliated website, saying that a delegation from Hamas leaders is waiting to get outside of Gaza through Rafah checkpoint to get the approval of the Egyptian side in order to to make all kinds of appointments in Cairo, in Ankara, and in other uh, Egypt, not Egyptian, Arab and Islamic uh, capitals. Now. We don't know yet what will be the Egyptian response, whether they're going to approve this uh, delegation to, to exit to Gaza exit or them. not, but something is going on. I mean, I, I don't think that so many Hamas officials, including one of the advisors of, uh, uh, of the, the Turkish president, would come out, stand out and say there is a coming agreement. And they are saying it, they, it on record, in their name, and then again, the Israelis are saying, well, we don't know, but it might be something might happen around us. Okay, keep your day open because we will bring you tomorrow to talk about this. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, sure. thank you very much. I thank you. And uh, we're going to the United States. Revelations about NSA surveillance programs are uh, taking on a new dimension with the latest leaks passed on to the New York Times. They implicate telecommunications companies AT&T and Ver uh, Ver Verizon uh, with AT&T as a highly collaborative partner of the NSA in collecting data. Shai ben -Ari has the details. Government surveillance conducted by the U.S. National Security Agency continues to make headlines. Documents leaked by Edward Snowden and published by the New York Times and ProPublica shed new light on the depth of cooperation between the agency and telecommunications company AT&T. The documents reveal the company allowed the NSA access to billions of client emails as well as phone call metadata. AT&T engineers installed surveillance equipment in at least 17 of its Internet hubs in U.S. territory. The emails were accessible to analysts on a keyword search basis. While accessing communications between U.S. citizens would necessitate a special court warrant, if a foreign national was communicating with an American citizen, his or her emails could be accessible even without a warrant, not to mention communications between non-U.S. citizens. I was a critic of the previous administration for those occasions in which I felt they had violated our values. What I have been able to do is examine and scrub how our intelligence services are operating, and I'm confident that at this point, we have struck the appropriate balance. The documents do not refer to AT&T by name, but rather to a partner in a program codenamed Fairview. A range of evidence, including technical terms specific to AT&T, points to the company being the NSA's partner, also confirmed by former intelligence officials to the New York Times. The documents refer to the company being highly collaborative, and commend its extreme willingness to help. They refer to the period between 2003 and 2013, and it is unclear if the same surveillance procedures are still in effect today. For most of that period, General Keith Alexander headed the NSA. There's a lot of people out there screaming and yelling. We're not listening to their phone calls. We're not reading their email. We're defending this country. We'll do it right. We'll hold ourselves accountable. The documents even reveal the NSA had access to the network of the UN headquarters in New York. In reaction to the New York Times story, an AT&T spokesman said the company does not voluntarily provide information to any investigating authorities other than if a person's life is in danger and time is of the essence. There was no further elaboration. And with me uh, right now is defense and government analyst for her arts daily newspaper. Good evening, I'm here, Oren. Lucy. What? Are you so naive? You're, I'm, you're a sophisticated lady, a, I didn't a woman even of the ask. world. I didn't even 
ask, do you know what I'm going to ask you? Why are you so shocked? <laughs> of course they are spying on everyone. What it, else is new? Because if we're talking about AT&T and Verizon, they are not spying only on people in the United States. This is a matter of the entire world or any AT&T and Verizon well, technically, it's, technically, it's not really spying. Okay. It's information collection, okay. of course. Now, there's such a big volume of emails billions and trillions of emails every day no one is going to go over your well perhaps your own emails would be Maybe. of curiosity very interesting. yes <laughs> but usually what you would have is some search term mm -hmm. some word either a direct reference to a terror act which is going to take place or a veiled reference, a hint, some of the words used like a party or a wedding. And all of those words are going to get the uh, agencies to focus on the emails and the senders. And the rest of mankind is going um, scot-free. So there is really no big problem. And you know, one, one has to, to wonder, why do the Americans allow people to go into stores and buy guns and kill everyone inside, but they are so excited about this measure, which is going to protect them? I'm trying also to, uh, I'm seeing this a specific situation and I'm seeing that basically all our information because we're like all day on our phones so all our information is outside so what is like you're saying the big deal and more than that what is preventing that if after they saw the mails and they saw that they are not interested what is actually securing me that um, somebody who I don't know or just a criminal will get into my account and just break it Yes, uh, criminals can do it and uh, private detectives can do it. With a good amount of money, it can happen. Not only your emails, even when you write a note to yourself, even when you hit one of the uh, keys there, someone else may pick it up, someone who may not be as benevolent as your government. And yes, this is the world we live in. You can throw away your, your smartphone, the sea is out there, throw it into the sea, you will be free of surveillance. You may have some difficulties in connecting with others, but this is the price we pay for being uh, in touch. Can we go back 10 years ago? No, huh? 10 years ago, uh, when you used to send me notes in a bottle? <laughs> I will send you notes right. in a bottle. I will call you. Uh, with Please do. Amir Oren, thank you very much for this. And uh, we're going out for a break, two minute break, and then we will be back with a note in a bottle. Don't go anywhere. Dozens of officials, including former Prime Minister Nouri al Maliki, are referred to court over the fall of Mosul to the Islamic State, while military commanders face a court martial over the fall of Ramadi. An Indonesian passenger plane with 54 people on board disappears off the grid, now believed to have crashed in the mountains' eastern Papua region. The Israeli government approves a highly controversial deal to develop offshore gas fields that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says will deliver a massive windfall of cash in the country. Welcome back to the news today. It's a story so familiar, it's almost hard to believe. A passenger plane that goes missing mid-flight. A plane operated by Indonesian carrier, carrier Trigana Air lost contact with air traffic control before 6 a.m. GMT with 54 people on board. Now is believed to have crashed in the Papua region. Or Shapira has the latest. Another aviation crisis involving an Indonesian airline a Trigana Air Service plane carrying 54 people crashed in Indonesia's eastern Papua region. The country's transport minister told reporters that wreckage of the plane had been found in the Bintaj Mountains. It is not yet known if anyone survived the crash. The officials of the National Search and Rescue Agency will go there with the Air Transportation Director General later tonight to facilitate the evacuation work and clarify things to the families of passengers on board. 
evacuasi. Earlier Sunday, the plant lost contact with ground control while flying from Papua's provincial capital Jayapura to Oksibil. The weather in the area was poor with heavy rain, strong winds and fog. Up until the last minute, employees of the Indonesian airline did not lose their faith. All I know now is that we can only hope that the flight is still there and the people on board survive. Over the last year, Indonesia has been linked to two major aviation disasters. In December, an Air Asia plane took off from the Indonesian city of Surabaya to Singapore and crashed in the Java Sea, leaving 162 casualties. In June, an Indonesian military plane crashed into a populated area in the city of Medan, leaving 142 people dead. Trigada itself has been involved in 14 serious incidents since it began operating in 1991. And with me right now is aviation expert Aaron Lapidot. Good evening. Thank you very Good much uh, for joining me. Uh, what does it mean exactly seeing all these disasters happening to, in Indonesia, in Indonesian uh, flights? It means what? That they don't have enough experience to actually go and fly uh, a plane? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, Indonesia is ranking one of the lowest countries regarding air safety in the world. They are very, very low, and uh, they, they have uh, a lot of troubles. Uh, your reporter just mentioned the latest two. But uh, during the years, uh, it's been very, very uh, dangerous to fly in Indonesia. And um, it's a small wonder that uh, this uh, unfortunate accident happened there. So if we're talking about the accidents are happening because of lack of experience or they're happening because of bad weather? Well, bad weather is, uh, is, is very... Um, uh, usually uh, maybe blamed, but uh, usually it's, uh, the blame is false. Because the, the, um, most of the, in most of the incidents, it's the human factor that uh, is uh, responsible for the accident. And uh, in, in a minority is the technical problem, and in very rare occasions is the weather. But this time, this uh, accident, the ATR-42, um, the Trigana Air, um, probably <coughs> the, uh, the weather was a factor because uh, it was reported that it was a very bad weather over that, over that uh, region where he, um, he was flying. Because most of the accidents that we're seeing are happening actually in this region. So is it uh, the planes that are not uh, maintained in a good way, that is the people who are not able to actually fly up planes in, in this uh, specific uh, area or don't have enough experience, or is it the combination of everything together? Well, usually for an accident to occur, it's a combination of many, many reasons. But you are right in assuming that the maintenance is very poor. It's, it's below standards. The uh, ICAO, which is the International uh, Association of Pilots uh, in, in the world, it's uh, of uh, airlines in the world, it's, it's, uh, uh, they ranked uh, every feature of, of the Indonesian uh, aviation, and each and every one factor is like below 50% of what is required of a Western airline to perform. So how come the world is not doing anything to provide some kind of help or some kind of new techniques? Or is it just part of a budget of a not developed country that doesn't have enough money to actually put in its aviation companies? It's not so much the responsibility of the world, it's more the responsibility of the government of uh, Indonesia. Because let's say if you want to visit Jakarta, you, you probably take uh, uh, a better uh, airliner, a uh, Western airline or whatever um, uh, better record airline there is that's flying to Jakarta. And, and uh, when you leave Indonesia, you're going to do the same thing. The uh, local uh, airlines are usually, unfortunately for them, are used by the local uh, population. So uh, it's, it's more the responsibility of their government. Out of all the Indonesian airlines that exist, only four at, are not uh, on the blacklist of uh, airlines in the world and are uh, permitted to land in the European uh, uh, Union 
uh, <coughs> airfields. All the others are not permitted to do so. So, you know, only by this you can uh, yeah. actually understand what's going on Basically, there. if you want to uh, pay for your safety, pay a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, Pidot, thank you very much for this. Thank you. In the midst of uh, dealing with the debt crisis, Greece is finding a new common ground with Europe. The migrant crisis. Cos Island is in uh, Greece is only one of the stops for refugees from across the Middle East who escape from their war-torn countries. I'm in 60 has more. As morning rises over the scenic Greek island of Kos, it's an uncertain start of the day for these migrants who have made the dangerous journey here from their countries of origin. To them, this utopian vacation resort is just a safe haven from the war at home. But with the growing number of those seeking refuge, an unexpected screening system has been put in place. I'm waiting, but he don't help me. Just uh, help for Syria. Because uh, I tell you, he don't know what's happened in Iraq and in Pakistan and Iran. Migrants from countries other than Syria found themselves turned away as Syrians who are deemed refugees were given priority. Those who do manage to make it on the island are staying at this abandoned hotel waiting for assistance. If this isn't a humanitarian situation, I don't know what is. Um, to not have any water, any food, a place to sleep, any kind of shelter. If there's anything, this isn't, you know, a Greece problem in particular, obviously it is, but this is a global problem and we need our governments and the people that we are paying for to step up and, and create more aid. Meanwhile, the Greek government has chartered a ship to provide accommodation for around 2,500 Syrians in its cabins. Boarding began Saturday night, with the island being just a stop for the refugees in a yet unfinished journey. We're waiting for the personal papers to leave Greek. According to the International Organization for Migration, an estimated quarter of a million migrants have crossed the Mediterranean to Europe this year. Half of them wound up on the Greek islands. For some, the promise of paradise is a far cry from reality. Uh, we thought before that uh, Europe yeah, is better. And uh, because of that, we left our country and we came here. But in here, nobody attention. Uh, we have no money and uh, we have nothing for eating. Like this problem. Now we're going to the U.S. presidential elections, which, uh, which uh, produced uh, quite a few headlines over the weekend. The candidates are making the rounds on the Sunday morning political shows, among them Donald Trump, who made his uh, stance on immigration clear. They are going to be such a wealthy, such a powerful nation. They are going to have nuclear weapons. They are going to take over parts of the world that you wouldn't believe. And I think it's going to lead to nuclear holocaust. And I, I will say this. The people that negotiated that deal, namely Kerry and his friends, are incompetent. Yes, and we're still there with uh, deep fry fried uh, nachos and corn dogs as a uh, backdrop. Candidates from the 2016 U.S. presidential elections took their campaigns to Iowa this weekend. On the grill this time, blast from the past. Same name, different persona, Bush versus Clinton. Corey Shapiro explains. For some, it may look like a rerun of the 1992 election between George Bush and Bill Clinton, as Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton and Republican candidate Jeb Bush sparred over mutual accusations. On Tuesday, Bush accused Clinton of being responsible for the rise of the Islamic State in her role as a Secretary of State in the Obama administration. He pointed at Obama's decision to withdraw from Iraq in 2011 as a fatal error which led to the escalation. ISIS grew while the United States disengaged from the Middle East and ignored the threat. And where was the Secretary of State? Where was Secretary of State Clinton in all of this? Like the President himself, she had opposed the surge, then joined in claiming credit for its success. Hillary waited three days before she hit back. On the campaign trail at the Iowa State Fair, Clinton questioned why Jeb Bush was leaving his brother's policies out of the context. And the entire picture, as you know, includes the agreement that George W. Bush made with the Maliki government in Iraq that set the end of 2011 
as the date to withdraw American troops. That but when two are fighting, does the third win? The latest polls continue to give American billionaire Donald Trump the lead in the Republican race. And for now, it seems he recovered from his controversial comment against Fox anchor Megyn Kelly. Trump, who also came to Iowa over the weekend, slammed both Clinton and Bush and promised his voters that as opposed to his opponents, he is not for sale. They give five million dollars or two million or a million to Jeb. They have him just like a puppet. He'll do whatever they want. The campaign has just begun and it's still hard to predict who will gain the ticket in November 2016. But one thing is sure, it's going to be a fascinating and a very bumpy road to the White House. And with me right now is Owen Alterman, research fellow at the INSS. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. You know, these two, Clinton and Bush, were supposed to be the highlights of uh, this race. And here comes Donald Trump. And just put them in the shadow. And this leaves them with what? Just really dull, boring campaign. More or less, yeah. <laughs> Donald Trump is still in the show. And these two, the most exciting thing that they can think of to do is actually to fight over policy, to fight over things that actually matter, whether it be the Iraq war or whether it be college affordability, that they've actually responded with a real policy debate of some kind. Whether that can actually inspire and excite their voters is something we'll have to see. Excite the voters or excite the United States? Because it seems that it doesn't excite the United States. The United States, it's, the United States uh, is not occupied with things that matter, like you're saying, but occupied with what Donald Trump will say the next phrase of, or his punchline will be. Donald Trump has proven to be in many ways a gifted politician. Uh, he's a man who's just an amazing communicator. He knows how to get media attention. He knows how to drive an issue. He knows how to drive the agenda. And that's a big part of uh, having an effective presidential campaign and even being an effective president. And his ability to do that and the contrast, as you said, between Bush and Clinton in some ways may point to certain weaknesses in their candidacy. Yeah, but until, you know, except of seeing him going with a hat saying <laughs> make uh, America great again and saying that they're talking about like this big phrases like nuclear, uh, holocaust, uh, big, it's big wars and... and Except of that, we don't see real policy from him. And this is, I'm asking myself, until when it can last, all these slogans, all these big phrases, like if we're seeing from, on the other hand, that people like Bush, like Clinton, are actually dealing with the real issues. You're absolutely right. What Donald Trump has succeeded in doing is picking out a few issues, a few signature issues like immigration, like trade policy, and putting them on the public agenda. What we have not yet seen from him are more detailed policy ideas and policy proposals. His campaign has said that starting this week they're going to put these proposals out, but we haven't seen them, and until we have, until we've seen them, they're not there. You know, I'm asking myself, what can Donald Trump, a wealthy man, really, and that never maybe knew, he's rich. He never knew, like, uh, let's say, a dull day. He never <laughs> knew a day that he cannot bring to his family, uh, you know, a plate with food. What can he really understand about the need of the people, about the split between white and black in the United States, about the fact that there is poverty in the United States? You know, these are the things that matter. Well, this is a really, really interesting point. Presidential candidates, one of the things that they love to do is talk about their family background, their biographies, and use that as a way to connect with the average person. And many of these candidates on the Republican side really do have personal stories that they can use in that way. As you said, Donald Trump doesn't. Even though he made much of his wealth by himself, he was born to a father who was quite wealthy. Uh, even though, as I said, Trump himself was able to multiply that. But he doesn't have that middle class or that working class background that others do. That said, what's very interesting is that in focus groups that are being conducted on the Republican campaign, a lot of Republican voters are saying that they can really relate to Trump and they feel like Trump is really voicing their own concerns. And that Trump, even though he's a multi-billionaire, has somehow in a really amazing way managed to connect with the average person and make them feel like he's fighting for them. And that's been a real asset for his campaign so far. Maybe people are seeing that they can be also also <laughs> like Donald Trump. I don't know if it's a good thing, Owen. Uh, Owen Alterman, thank you very much for My this. My pleasure. <laughs>
And now to Cuba, the, the American embassy back in business, the stars and stripes waving again after more than 50 years. And now the question, when will U.S. visitors follow? ABC has more. American businesses streaming into Havana Airport, researching the market and potential. The sky's the limit. The Cuban people are wonderful. So I think it's a great opportunity. American tourism up an estimated 35 to 50 percent. The Secretary of State, who toured Old Havana himself, encouraging Americans to take advantage of the newly relaxed regulations that allow specific types of tourism. Americans getting to know Cubans and Cubans getting to know Americans and is the way that, in fact, a transformation is going to be affected. This Minnesota couple here in Cuba staying with Airbnb, which now rents 2,000 rooms, helped by a hotel shortage and a rush of Americans who want to experience Cuba before it changes. So it, was, it was a great time to come. It's like a special time in history. Do you feel like you're being watched? Do you feel um, as though you're living in a communist or visiting a communist country police state? Oh, I haven't noticed yeah, it at all. Mm -mm. Cuba defying the old Cold War perceptions of secrecy and intrigue. Jim Avila, ABC News, Havana. And uh, me and Neve Ellis here are not going to Havana for now. Unfortunately, for but maybe we can plan a trip. I think that's a great idea. We should plan a trip. <laughs> <laughs> but for reporting, for reporting. For, we need to go and report on Of course, only for reporting. Not for the beaches. But let's, <laughs> let's think how... Um, it's convenient, mm -hmm. let's say, for Cuba right now, or it comes in a really good timing when the United States economy is actually really established. Mm -hmm. It's on the rise. It's going on a good path. And for Cuba, it can benefit from all this. Absolutely. What's interesting is that throughout the years of the embargo, there's been an interesting thing that uh, Cuba couldn't get anything from the U.S., but they could still sell some things to the U.S. Or sorry, the other way around, and they would get uh, they would get humanitarian aid. They'd get farm. So now it's totally upending the relationship. But the thing is, it's going to still take a lot of time because even though this is a huge opening up, and you know John Kerry raising the flag of embassy is very important symbolically, the big thing economically is that the embargo is still in place, which means that most trade can't happen yet. And it takes an act of Congress to lift the embargo, which blocks most of the trade be between the two countries. So even though we're starting to see the beginning of things now, the big payoff for Cuba is still going to be a little bit of a ways off. So except of the cigars, we can say that at least, uh, let's say, tourism can start flourishing in mm -hmm. Cuba? Absolutely. And they've seen double-digit growth in tourism every month in the last couple of months. Uh, and again, Obama, when he made this announcement, he opened up a lot of categories for people to visit. But it's still more difficult. Uh, one of the things that has been interesting, though, is that because the embargo is still in place, all these other countries are coming in and starting to lay the groundwork for what they expect to be a big tourist boom. So they're building hotels, and they're building resorts, and they're doing all these things. And the American hotel chains are saying, wait, we can't get in on this. You know, It's, it's going to be our tourism, but we're not actually going to be the ones who can build the hotels and profit from it. So if we're looking right now at the the current situation and in the near future, what can really Cuba benefit from uh, this in, let's say, in the next two years? The big thing right now is, as you mentioned, tourism, because that's such a big part of their economy already. Uh, one of the problems is that a lot of the things Cuba needs in order to get investment and to get its economy going uh, are still being held back by the bureaucracy. Cuba's still not a great place to do business, but they're starting to change. I mean, one of the things that's really fascinating is that all these years, Cuba's had two different currencies, one for the local people and one for tourists. And they're starting to phase that out. And that's supposed to be something that should be gone by next April, which means that, great, tourism can come and it won't just be relegated to a tiny part of the economy. It might actually start integrating and helping Cubans. I want to uh, just uh, take you on the point of uh, the embargo and the lifting of the embargo. Uh, if we're looking at this, one of the reasons is maybe to stop uh, migration from mm -hmm. Cuba to the United States. Isn't it in the United States benefit to actually lift the embargo it and, absolutely is. Yeah. and prevent people from actually coming to Cuba but invest in their own country? So the embargo, it's, it's interesting because it's one of those politically entrenched things. It was considered a big, brave thing that Obama did uh, by going and sort of opening these diplomatic channels again. But the majority of Americans, almost something like 75% of Americans, 
uh, want to lift the embargo. In fact, over 50 percent of Republicans want to lift the embargo. But there's still pressure groups and political forces that are in place, which means it might be a while before that happens. Not to mention that the United States still wants some leverage on Cuba when they say, hey, listen, we want you to reform, we want you to change in human rights, we want you to open up a little bit. And lifting the embargo is a sort of carrot for the end of those. Yeah, and when you have uh, so many years in an illegal economy, it's, um, let's say, very hard to change it in one it day. It takes a while. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nick for Thank this. Thank you. And we're going uh, to China. It's still a disaster zone in Tianjin, China, the site of two massive explosions at a chemical storage facility on Wednesday. Officials have confirmed the presence of over 100 tons of the deadly sodium cyanide, and workers are attempting to clear the area of chemicals before expected rain showers, which would create toxic gas. Yuav Bolvitz has more. Residents within a three-kilometer radius of the site of giant chemical explosions in the Chinese port of Tianjin were evacuated Saturday over fears of highly poisonous sodium cyanide as fresh blasts were heard and the death toll rose to at least 112 and more than 700 have been hospitalized. More than 60 specialized anti-chemical soldiers in heavy uniforms entered the core area of the blast site to search for possible survivors. Another 90 joined them to working in shifts. We have taken samples of the soil and air across the core area of the blast site, except for some spots that remain inaccessible. Firefighters' families outside a government press conference on Saturday asked for news about their loved ones, who remain missing after being sent to the scene of the warehouse blast. So far, 21 firefighters have been confirmed killed. Several days have passed. I don't even know if my son is still alive or dead. The government won't give us any information at all. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping urged the authorities to learn the extremely profound lessons and keep safe growth and people's interest first in mind to avoid similar accidents. And with me right now, the greatest uh, tennis player in the world, Jonathan Reagan. Yes, yes, <laughs> such a good tennis player I am. Of course you are. Right? Yes. You no, know, I'm not lying, right? No, no. Uh, of course, no. but you will talk about one of the greatest uh, players yes, in the world yes. in tennis. I cannot beat Serena Williams easily. Yes. Someone who apparently can is Belinda Bechnic. You, we have not really heard of her. She's she's a youngster, 18-year-old from Switzerland, and she beat Serena in the semifinal of the Toronto Open. This is rather surprising because Serena this year has been basically unbeatable. This is her second defeat in 45 games. Uh, she won the three previous Grand Slams of the season, and she's seen as a clear favorite uh, to, to take the U.S. Open, which begins at the end of the month in New York. Even when Serena had tougher years, the U.S. Open was always her thing. But then again, uh, uh, when, when amazing. yes, that was, that, that was an amazing point. And Serena congratulated Bechnich for, for taking an, a, a great point. And then again, Bechnich, uh, first of all, this coming two weeks before the U.S. Open, surely uh, making a point. And as for Serena Williams, we'll see New York if she's really up to it. She still is a great favorite. Even she can lose occasionally. It can happen. It can happen. It like you happen. are yeah. losing occasionally. Oh, only occasionally. Oh, Other times, I'm, I'm winning all the time. <laughs> Of Me too, by but the of way. course. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Buddy. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> Mick Fanning. Mick Fanning, remember him, the guy with the sharks. Uh, so he's back to competing. The first time, the first competition, we we did see him getting back to the water a few days after. Mm -hmm. We're less than a month. This is in Tahiti, a place where there are sharks. There's warm waters and sharks. Is he afraid? Doubtful. Uh, I don't see him really scared you know, here. I think that if I don't think that he's afraid, but if he will encounter another shark. It, we, we are calling it in Israel manhus. It yes, will be yes. Like a <laughs> like really again bad and luck. again, yes. Yeah, yeah, it will so be a really bad luck. Let's hope for Mick Fanning and for the manhus worldwide <laughs> that it will not happen. Manhusing. And uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh. Well, uh, now, when I stop, when I will finally stop laughing, I will, <laughs> I will say that you always you're, you're mad at me for not bringing flying people. Today I am. Yes. Uh, it's, um, uh, the, we're back to the circuit of the cliff diving, 
and uh, it's in Bosnia this time. Beautiful oh. setting, beautiful setting. Gary Hunt surprisingly did not win. He did not even make it to the top three, but he did get enough points to secure um, the the, um, the uh, world championship. The fifth time he's um, winning it. He also won the gold medal in the um, uh, what was it? The, the jumping. Uh, uh, the it's called the jumping uh, world championship, which was held in Kazan. Uh, jumping to the water and he's uh, obviously dominating this world even if he did not win this time in Bosnia it's like I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this and why well it's like it's beautiful it's beautiful I'm not like I'm, I'm not complaining that you brought me flying people because they are flying people but, but, but why are they flying why it's like what it's like, and how deep are they going in? I would love, I would love to be brave enough to do this, but I'm not. It's just like, it, it, somebody's earning money from it. Are they yeah, earning? Money a from lot it? of money, by the way. If, if you're the cliff diving world champion for the fifth time, you're earning a lot of money, and you're jumping in beautiful settings. Yeah. But if something ever goes wrong, if there's a shark from the previous item down there, and they have like something when who's happening to them? Like... I would say. <laughs> Harbudar, by the way, <laughs> is war and uh, chaos. Yes, all yes. over <laughs> the place. In Middle <laughs> Eastern. So we um, we have a host, we have Harbudar for our viewers. And now, and now and we have the flash, yes. <laughs> we're going for an update with our news desk, and then we will be back with no new word in Hebrew or in Arabic. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank Reagan. you, Rosie. Small break. <laughs> Welcome back to the news today, and uh, right now we are in the week in Israeli politics from controversial appointment of right-wing minister Danny Danone to be Israel's ambassador to the UN to a controversial gas deal. And with me to discuss this is diplomatic correspondent for the news today, Eli Ochenberg. Good evening. Good evening, Elsa. And also professor of political science, Dr. Hani Zubeda, whom I'm not speaking with only on the, in this uh, studio. Hello. Hi, Lucy. How, <laughs> How are, are you? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's uh, start. Before we will talk about about Danny Danone and our viewers in the United States, which probably would like to know who is this guy. Let's talk about the deal in uh, the making, we can say, the gas yeah. deal, yes. Well, we can't really say anything about the content of, of the deal because nobody really knows what's the content of the deal. No, there is one, somebody who well, knows, the, which well, is Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, well, I, I, I would honorably disagree. I don't think he knows what's the deal. He gave it to Steinitz, who in turn went to the gas companies and they gave it to their lobbyists and their economists. So the deal is only something they know. Now, tomorrow they need to vote on the deal. As it looks right now, one minister said that he will not vote for the deal. That's not enough because that's 60 to 59, not vote abstain. If somebody from the coalition will vote nay, that means that the deal will fall. As it seems right now, Benjamin Netanyahu is doing the best he can in order to solidify his coalition. People are saying the deal is bad. I can't really say why is it bad, because I have been requesting the deal for more than two days and nobody's giving it to us. The bottom line is that Netanyahu, as uh, Hani uh, said, really wants this deal to go forward. But if he wants the deal to go forward and he doesn't know, like Hani's saying, actually what the deal is, is, so how come he wants this deal to go forward? So his way of ruling, uh, and in this uh, cases uh, especially, is no excuses. All the coalition members are in the plenum voting in favor of the agreement and who, uh, uh, and, and who will disobey this uh, order will uh, have trouble later on. There, there is somebody who disobeyed uh, or... One person, Avi Gabay. Avi Gabay. But he's of... not a parliament member, so it does no, not he affect... Is. No, oh. he's not. Avi Gabay is not. He's, uh, he's the uh, environment minister. He's not a oh, parliament no, no, member. You're right, you're right. Uh, you're but right. Ali Adeli, he's a minister and, of yeah. course, uh, also a parliament member. And the, the debate with him is that he's not willing to uh, uh, to sign uh, uh, um, uh, this uh, agreement. That Clause says, 52. Yeah, that says that, uh, he, that the uh, cabinet can overrule the anti-trust uh, commissioner, and this is the main problem. Refresh my memory. Didn't we just uh, sat here just a few weeks ago? We spoke about Arya Derry, mm -hmm. uh, the interior minister that basically came and put uh, everything into chaos for Benjamin Netanyahu, and now what? Arya Deri does not want to be the guy who's going to lead this. He exactly. thinks it's a political suicide. What he wants is something as follows. He says, 
All the opposition will vote nay, 59 seats. What he's looking for right now are allies from within the coalition. Mm -hmm. What he did is he did not sign the Clause 52, which basically said, I will not overrule the state institution. Now, what you need to do, Benjamin Netanyahu, is solidify a deal, bring it back to the government. The government will approve, then we'll go to the Knesset. In the Knesset, Arya Deri believes that other coalition members will either abstain or vote nay. Now the question, which Benjamin Netanyahu is really pushing forward, is for an open vote. He wants a, a, a call, um, a roll call vote. That means somebody will be called by name and he will say yay or nay. And at this moment, Benjamin Netanyahu thinks he will be able to solidify the coalition. The issue is here between billions or hundreds of billions, the state of Israel is standing at a threshold. This is the biggest resource that what we have. What are the chances that it will pass? It's uh, very unclear at the moment. Netanyahu is doing the best he can to uh, uh, to make this uh, agreement uh, pass, but nothing is guaranteed because, again, there are many people within the coalition, within the government, who uh, uh, severely object, and this takes us, you know, to do it. His Next uh, subject, uh, very easily, people who do not uh, uh, see yeah. things. Obey uh, to uh, uh, yeah, and that brings and us to the new really UN ambassador. Guests. Exactly. Yes. Uh, explain to me okay, how so come Danny Danon is a very uh, problematic uh, uh, Likud uh, member in uh, the eyes of, uh, of Netanyahu. He was the uh, uh, the chairman of the Likud uh, party, and he did a lot, a lot of troubles to Netanyahu. And the basic, you know, the basic issue of nominating someone who is a political burden to a certain extent to such an important diplomatic mission, it feels ki kind of shady. We have to... This is the things. person who uh, went out against mm -hmm. Benjamin Netanyahu as the vice minister during, of security. As the vice minister of security and was, during uh, Operation Protective Edge. He was fired. He was then fired, we are yeah. talking about the person who went on to the premiership of the Likud mm -hmm. against Benjamin head Netanyahu. And now this guy is actually going to represent Israel in the UN. So explain to me because either you need to really be against Benjamin Netanyahu to get good positions, or really Benjamin Netanyahu needs him out of his sight to well, stop doing depends, a lot of troubles? It depends what you call good positions. And Danny Danon came from nowhere. The first, mm -hmm. the first primaries, he came from the local primaries. And he managed to infiltrate the Likud. Ever since, he's been the extreme right hardliner. He is extremely right no two-state solution, annexing uh, Judea and Samaria. No, he, for him, we need to go into Gaza by foot and, and flatten areas. He has zero tolerance towards any type of negotiation. Now, the thing is, he became extremely popular within the Likud. Because of his hawkish yes. decisions. Uh, opinions and the thing is that unlike other diplomatic missions if you're I don't know like an ambassador to a certain country and when you can uh, focus on economic relations technology social issues at the UN you cannot avoid the political issues and someone as hawkish as Danon will have great trouble and you know even socializing with his colleagues who are uh, namely the, U the US uh, ambassador to the UN Samantha Powers who is highly liberal and more than that people there will know that he's not the confidant of Netanyahu. You know, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, we interviewed him here. Uh, I interviewed him before in other places. This guy uh, is, how can I put it in a um, politically correct way? <laughs> He is talking like the people who are writing comments on Facebook and the Twitter and the, like really in a low level. This is not, well, and in front of the international arena, when Israel is in such difficult position, especially in the UN, is this really the guide to send to demolish even the international life relations that we already don't have with the world? Since I'm not Benjamin Netanyahu, it can be one of two. Either Benjamin Netanyahu says, I don't care about the UN. I don't care about diplomatic relations within the UN. Let me send him, because then I, I literally take two birds in one stone. First, I move away one of my greatest opponents within the Likud. Two, I'm going to show the UN how it feels to handle somebody who is extremely hawkish because they won't listen mm -hmm. to the sound of reason, which is Ron Posal, which is the current ambassador to the UN. Or, on the other hand, Benjamin Netanyahu says, they're going to strike the deal with Iran. 
the UN is anti-Israeli, pro-Palestinian as is, let me send somebody who is an extreme hardliner and show them what is the other face of Israel, and maybe that will soften them. This can work. It has been done in the past. A lot of ambassadors, hostile ambassadors, were sent to friendly countries when the relationship between the two countries were shaky. And then what happened is a backdoor diplomacy asking for a better sentence. So instead of Danny Danone, they would get somebody else. I like those explanations, but excuse me for doubting them because it just, it's, the explanations are good. I just don't think this is the rationale of Netanyahu because it solves so many problems within uh, uh, the Israeli political sphere. It vacates the seat of a, of a minister, which he needs for Benny Begin and Sachin Egbi, uh, liquid <coughs> members who, uh, uh, who were crushed uh, after the coalition agreement. Uh, it, it, he, he again he clears the way from uh, of, uh, of a troublemaking uh, a Likud member. So I think it, it benefits Netanyahu in the inner political arena way too much for him to consider the diplomatic uh, reasons. <sighs> Hani Zubeda, thank you very much. Thank you. Ali Lochenberg, thank you very much. Thank you. And now stay with me because we're going to something good and sad. Okay. Uh, like the like the, <laughs> like the UN. Uh, musical legend. Today marks 38 years since Elvis Presley was found dead in his home at the age of 42. His musical legacy leave, lives on, and some believe he does too. So is the king still alive and well and celebrating 80 years old? Ima Siksik takes a look at the rumor that just won't die. August 16, 1977, thousands of mourning fans take to the streets of Memphis to escort the king of rock and roll on his final royal journey. It's a day of nationwide shock as Elvis Presley died at the age of 42. Or did he? The king would have been 80 today, but since his death, sightings of him have been a common occurrence with many claiming he's still alive to this day. Hundreds of thousands still gather for the annual Memorial Day in Graceland, but for some, remembering Elvis is just not enough. I got a regular job. I'm trying to do this full time, but until it happens, I, I drive a truck for a living at a, at a place in Kansas City. Elvis is likely the single most impersonated artist in recent history. The replication of his performances, complete with the signature clothing, hairstyle and revolutionary dance moves, is another enduring tradition of not letting Elvis go. For those who insist on keeping the king alive on stage, this is more than just a hobby. I always look like this, minus some of the makeup, but, but the hair is always the same, sideburns, everything. Um, and I, I get a lot from the customers that I travel around and see. They ask me for my autograph or whatever and pictures. So if Elvis is alive, where might he be? That might be too cynical a question for the diehard fans who swear by his survival. People don't understand this. You know, my family doesn't understand it. Um, people I work with don't understand it. But her and I get it, so we don't have to explain it to each other, you know? And why does the legend of his life keep living on? The answer could be in the numbers. Elvis was the first physical, real person to, to be put on, you know, clothing and t-shirts and shoes and pencils and perfume and record players and that sort of thing. And, uh, and today he remains a popular seller. Elvis Presley Enterprises, managed by Elvis's daughter, Lisa Marie, profits from the tourists who visit Graceland each year. A yearly average of 600,000 people more than half a million reasons to keep the King of Rock alive. And with me right now is Ivan Sixta. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. I, I don't know. I heard a rumor that he is uh, uh, over there in Las Vegas, uh, sitting in a diner with Michael Jackson, John Kennedy, and him enjoying hamburger. Marilyn Monroe, I think, <laughs> Marilyn, stopped by. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a stubborn rumor, Lucy, for a reason. L look at it this way. If you had a business that for 38 years was selling records and T-shirts and mugs and everything else you can imagine in a scope of millions and millions of dollars every year, wouldn't you want to keep the story alive as well? Of and maybe you want to keep profit the story from alive. it a little yeah. bit? How many men can you 
see uh, today like Elvis Presley. That's true. People do not want to believe that he's gone. And maybe that's why we keep hearing these crazy stories from people who claim they saw him in Graceland to people who say they saw his image in a loaf of bread that was discovered to them. It's all been said. People do not want to accept that the king is dead, probably because there hasn't been, as you say, someone like Elvis ever since. You know, what makes us uh, uh, really want to keep the legends um, like Michael Jackson, like Elvis Presley alive? Is it because we don't, we want to just uh, stay and grip uh, the history and, and not let go? Well, there's something wow. very tragic about such a huge success and such a young life ending so briefly and suddenly. When you think about someone who's young, 42 years old, who died in these really tragic circumstances of a heart attack, a alone in the house with no one around and found later by someone else. It's really sad to think of where he was and what, how that ended. And in a way that forces us to deal with our own mortality, we don't want to see our heroes dead in this way. But this is also something that pertains to American culture in general. You have these stories all over James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, of course. Definitely. And recently, Michael Jackson, Amy Winehouse. These are all people who died in very, very tragic very uh, circumstances. Very talented people. Very talented people. Like, we're talking about uh, maybe some stones in, in history that we don't want, like the Beatles, for example. And a lot of people are saying also that some of the people, uh, some of the members of the people the Beatles are still alive. That's true. I, I mean, he was part of a generation with Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix, who died in the same year, seven years before him, that also really started this horrible trend of hugely talented artists self-destructing on drugs and alcohol to a tragic, tragic end. Let's ask, can we uh, let the viewers hear some uh, sound uh, from uh, Elvis Presley for this? <laughs> Elvis, the one and only. You know what's funny? You hear the girl swooning, people still swoon the same way when they hear him now. Yes, definitely. Elvis has left the building a long, long time ago, and we are just about to leave the building as well. I'm in Six Six. Thank you very, very you, much Lucy. for this beautiful memories. That's it for tonight. Tomorrow we'll be here at the same time, same place from the Jaffa Port Israel. Have peace, have tender love.